Welcome to my cave. A couple of episodes ago, we made an oscillator around an IC Schmidt trigger. We found that we couldn't make either the amplitude or the frequency repeatable, because the voltage thresholds of the Schmidt trigger varied so much from one IC to another. This time we're going to fix that by making a more predictable Schmidt trigger. We're going to base our design on an IC called a voltage comparator. Here I'm using an LM311, which is an ancient design. I can remember using it as far back as the 1970s. In fact, I found one of similar vintage in my parts box. When I look at any of the big electronics distributors, I see that they've got tens of thousands in stock from a half a dozen ma different manufacturers. What's a comparator, you might ask, especially since I haven't used one yet in this series? Somewhat confusingly, a comparator has the same schematic symbol as an op-amp. And it behaves like an op-amp in that it amplifies the difference between its inputs with an extremely high gain, typically 100,000 or more. But there are some important differences. An op-amp is designed to output an analog signal and generally runs with a feedback loop to hold its input voltages equal. A comparator is designed to run without negative feedback. It outputs a digital signal. If the plus input is at a higher voltage than the minus input, it outputs a logic high. If the plus input is at a lower voltage than the minus input, it outputs the logic low. It is happy with a high voltage difference between the inputs, and it can recover fast from it. In fact, the only real requirement the 311 has is that the input voltage has to be at least a diode drop above the negative power rail, and at least two diode drops below the positive one. And you can actually pull either input as high as the power rail as long as you don't pull both inputs up there at the same time. An ordinary op-amp might need some time to recover, and with some op-amps, a high voltage difference might even let out the magic smoke. An ordinary op-amp usually has its speed limited intentionally so that it won't oscillate, even if the output is connected directly to the minus input. A comparator is designed for the fastest possible voltage swing at the output, but it might very well oscillate with negative feedback, and the oscillation will be a little unpredictable. It might actually oscillate at a frequency too high to see on a low-end oscilloscope, and because of stray capacitance, it might behave itself on a breadboard but fail on an actual PC board, or it might stop oscillating when you hit it with an oscilloscope probe. So we won't use it that way. All the way to the rails it'll go. As we'll see, you often want to operate a comparator with some amount of positive feedback. So let me place a 311 in the circuit and tie it to the power supply rails. I'll also add bypass capacitors to the schematic so that I don't forget. If you look closely at the schematic symbol for the 311, you'll see this little diamond symbol on the output with a line below it. That tells us that the output drives in only the negative direction. On the 311, the output is just the open collector of an NPN transistor with the emitter tied to the ground pin of the chip. I'll tie that to the circuit ground. In order to get a voltage out, you need to tie the collector to the positive rail, so I'll tie the output to the plus 5 line with a pull-up resistor. 2.2 kilo ohms will make the output transistor on board the device pull a little over 2 milliamps when the output is low, which is well within its spec. We should get a logic signal out. I'll put a connector symbol in the schematic and label it square because I'm going to expect the comparator output to be a square wave at the oscillator frequency. I'm not going to bother with offset trimming and I don't need a strobe, so I'll leave those outputs floating. I'm going to design the oscillator so that this triangle wave is 2 volts peak to peak with the upper and lower thresholds at 1 and 3 volts. Those thresholds will be present at the plus input of the comparator. I'll get them with a voltage divider from the output back to the positive input. I'll use a 3 resistor divider so I can shift the levels to the 1 and 3 volt points. We already covered how to design a divider in a previous episode, so I'll just run through the design in a spreadsheet. The divider will be hooked up to plus 12 and minus 12 volt supplies. The logic output will be between 0 and 5 volts, and I want 1 and 3 volts at the comparator input. I'll choose a 47 kilo ohm resistor for R1 so as not to load the comparator output too badly. 
which now gives me values for R2 and R3. I'll pick the nearest 5% values and see how badly that messes me up. 1.03 and 3.06 volts? I can live with those numbers. Now we can fill those resistor values into the design. A 47K resistor from the comparator output into the divider, a 56K pull-up, and a 75K pull-down. That gives us our Schmidt trigger. Now we can go back to another earlier episode where we designed an oscillator around a Schmidt trigger. We'll connect a negative feedback resistor on the comparator and a capacitor to ground. Using the same spreadsheet as last time, I'll fill in the voltage thresholds that we designed for. I'll plug in a low value for frequency, A an octave below the base staff, and a value of 100K for the resistor. That gives me a value of 100 nanofarads or thereabouts for the capacitor. If I fill in 2.2K as a minimum resistance, it gives me a frequency a bit little above E flat in the top octave of the piano. That's plenty of tuning range. I'll plug those values into the schematic and go down to the cave to build it. So I've got it here on the breadboard. I'm going to hook up a scope probe to the square wave and a scope probe to the triangle wave and hit the power supply. And I've got a slow wave going. Let's see what it looks like. Ooh, that's interesting. Square wave isn't very square. That's not great. And the uh, triangle wave, I, I expect it to have the exponential characteristic, and it does. Okay, that's at the lowest frequency that it'll support, and what am I reading out for the frequency here? Just put channel one frequency, and what did it say? 54 hertz. I think that's pretty close to what the spreadsheet said. I crank it up. Ooh, that's interesting. The square wave starts showing a kind of triangular top to it. Yeah, something's wrong here. And at the high end, it's reading a frequency of about 2400 hertz. That's not as high as I expected. Uh, something is not right. What are minimum and maximum voltages? One and two and a half for the uh, Schmidt trigger. That's not quite what I had either. So there's something odd going on here. Yeah, it's oscillating and it's Schmidt triggering. So I know that much is right. I slow it down again. What I do here, I hit that. I hit the level by mistake, that's what happened. Okay. Now for min and max voltage, I'm seeing one and three when I slow it down. So there's something going wrong with the triggering and something going wrong with the voltage at the higher frequencies. I think the circuit topology has to be right because it wouldn't be oscillating otherwise. Oh, let me have a look at the schematic here. Hi, future Kevin here. My talking to myself got pretty incoherent 
because I saw the problem almost immediately when I looked at the schematic. I got too excited and tripped over my words. The issue is that this pull-up resistor is the only thing sourcing current when the output is high. Remember, the comparator output is an open collector. At the highest frequency, there's just a 2.2K resistor between that and whatever voltage is on the capacitor. So the output voltage will be halfway between the power rail and the capacitor voltage rather than being close to the rail. I need to substitute in a bigger resistor and a smaller capacitor. And I probably need a lower value pull-up too, so the output can source more current. I'll replace the 2.2K pull-up with a 470 ohm one. That's going to push 10 milliamps into the comparator output when the output is logic low, but that's within its rated drive capacity. I'll up the feedback resistance by a factor of 10. By using a 1 megohm pot, and a 22K resistor. That'll give the same tuning range if I decrease the capacitor by the same factor of 10 to 10 nanofarad. Unfortunately, checking my parts box, I don't see a one meg pot anywhere. Oh well, it's time to put together that parts order that I've been putting off sending out. But while I'm waiting for my parts, I thought of one more little thing. On a Schmidt trigger with slowly varying inputs, it's usually a good idea to add a tiny capacitor, anywhere from a few picofarads to 100 picofarads or so, in the negative feedback path. The reason is that there's delay in the positive feedback path because of input and wiring capacitance, so a noisy input signal can cause the output to make multiple transitions while the positive feedback path is trying to catch up. The capacitor cures that problem but it introduces some overshoot in the square wave, so don't go overboard on it. My box from the electronic distributor came in. Now I can make all the circuit changes that I just discussed. You surely don't need to watch me fumbling with the parts in real time, so I'll just fast forward through this part. I'll hook up the oscilloscope probes and give it another test. I hit the power switch, and I can see that the funny triangular tops of the square waves are gone, even at the highest frequency, which is now close to the 2500 hertz that I designed. The trip points of the Schmidt trigger are 1.12 and 3.04 volts, close to the 1.03 and 3.06 that the spreadsheet told us to expect. There's a little overshoot on the square wave, on the negative going transition, which is no doubt the effect of the speed-up capacitor. I'll turn the frequency dial to the other end of the range and adjust the scope sweep rate to see the wave again. The low end looks good too, with about the same voltages and a frequency within 2 Hz of what I targeted. Not too bad for what's essentially a back of the envelope calculation. So now I have what I need to make the amplitude and frequency repeatable. But I still need to worry about the shape of this triangular wave. It's asymmetric and its rise and fall are nowhere near straight lines. So next time, we're going to start working on those problems by driving the capacitor with a current instead of a voltage. Until then, stay tuned, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye.